Good morning, real life at home. So glad to have you with us this morning. Would you join us in your homes? Would you stand with us? We're going to lift our voices. We're going to sing to the, the King of all kings. It's time to worship him this morning. Let's do this.
with a shout. Yes, he does. People say, Hallelujah! 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 Praise Jehovah.
those who are crushed in spirit. And he comes and he just wraps his arms around those people and he just loves them. <laughs> he just loves them. It's so beautiful. He loves to do it. He loves to do it. Because he's so good.
We are so glad you are worshiping with us today. God is working in your heart and life right now. Whether you feel it or not, whether it seems like it or not, God is at work in you. Well, we're so glad you're with us today. My name is Tim. I'm the lead pastor here at Real Life Church in Laconia, New Hampshire. If you got your Bible, I would like you to turn with me to the book of Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16 is where we're going to be at today. Pastor JJ brought a great word to us last Sunday dealing with isolation versus intimacy. And if you missed it, I want to encourage you, go back and listen to it. It's on Facebook. It's on YouTube. You can go to our church online platform. You've got the links right there below. You can go back and listen to that service. It was a great, great message that challenged. I know it challenged me and it challenged many of us who heard the word. We've been in a series called Intimacy with God. And Exodus chapter 16 is where we're at today. And I'd like to read the first seven verses of Exodus chapter 16. And like we so often do, I'd like to invite you to stand with me where you are at, there in your home, or wherever you might be watching uh, and participating along with us. Exodus chapter 16, and we're going to be re begin reading with verse 1. Ready? Let's go. The entire Israelite community departed from Elam and came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after they had left the land of Egypt. The entire Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when we sat by pots of meat and ate all the bread we wanted, Instead, you brought us into this wilderness to make this whole assembly die of hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. This way, I will test them to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, This evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the Lord's glory, because he has heard your complaints about him. For who are we that you complain about us? Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that as we are in the word today, that you would make this come to life, that you would bring the words off of the pages, off of the screens, off our digital device, into our hearts, into our lives, where you can transform and shape us into everything that you've made us to be in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. You may be seated. So this week, as we are in the word, I want to give the title of the message. The title of the message is called Intimacy, Autopilot, and Manna. Intimacy, autopilot, and manna. Now, I know that sounds kind of funny, but as I was praying this week, the Lord was very clear in speaking some things to me. Here's a brief recap. The manna that I gathered yesterday, God's word, what God did in my life yesterday was for yesterday. How many of us try to survive today on yesterday's manna? Yesterday's manna was good for only one day of the week, the Sabbath day. Now, I'll explain more about that in just a minute. All the other days, yesterday's manna, according to Exodus 16, verse 20, as you read forward, was stinky and filled with worms. That's what yesterday's manna was good for, unless it was collected for the Sabbath day, on the sixth day. And that's the time that Moses instructed the people, because God commanded Moses, gather twice as much, because on the Sabbath day, I don't want you to do any work. It's a day of rest. So let's go ahead and get into this. Now, as we're looking at this, 
Go ahead and jump down with me to uh, verse 13. Verse 13 says this. So at the evening, quail came and covered the camp. God says, I want to take care of giving you meat. I want to take care of giving you bread. Because I remember their complaint was, oh, we don't have the meat that we used to have in Egypt. We don't have the bread like we used to have in Egypt. And God says, okay, fine. Watch this. So verse 13. So at evening, quail came and covered the camp. In the morning, there was a layer of dew all around the camp. When the layer of dew evaporated, there were fine flakes on the desert surface as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they asked one another, what is it? Because they didn't know what it was. And Moses told them, it is the bread of the Lord that God has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as each person needs to eat. You may take two quarts per individual, according to the number of people each of you has in his tent. So my family of five, we would have had ten quarts of manna. So the Israelites did this. Some gathered a lot, some a little. When they measured it by quarts, the person who gathered a lot had no surplus, and the person who gathered a little had no shortage. Each gathered as much as he needed to eat. Moses said to them, no one is to let any of it remain until morning. Watch this. Verse 19, or excuse me, verse 20. But they didn't listen to Moses. They didn't listen to Moses. Some people left part of it until morning, and it bred worms, and it stank. Therefore, Moses was angry with them. Then, then you read down, and it says, on the Sabbath day, the day that they were to get, or the day before they were to uh, collect double, so they wouldn't have to gather on Sabbath day. The Bible says that even some of them got up in the next morning on the Sabbath day and they went out to look and see and there was, oh, surprise, there's no manna on the ground. God really actually meant what he said. Imagine that. And Moses was upset with them again because the test was a test of obedience to see if God's people were going to listen to what God said. We've been talking about intimacy. Now, let's, let's look at this a little bit. I want us to see something here. I'd never thought about this until reading this passage of Scripture. The manna that was collected by everybody, the two quarts per person, uh, roughly, that is the manna that they said, uh, God said, use throughout the day and don't leave any of it for the next day because by the next day it's going to be stinky and it's going to be filled with worms. That's exactly what happened. They woke up the next day and the people that did that they opened it, and the Bible says it stank, and it was filled with worms. Now, look at this. This is interesting. This is what I've never seen before. The manna that was left on the ground, the Bible says, that it evaporated as the sun began to rise, and it got hot. It evaporated like the dew evaporates, because it came down like the dew every day, except for that seventh day of the week, where they were supposed to collect two times as much the day before in preparation for the Sabbath day. The manna that was left on the ground that kind of burned off as the sun rose, it didn't stink, nor was it filled with worms. Why? Because it just burned off. It just melted away, according to Exodus chapter 16, verse 21. It was the manna that got picked up, that got rotten after it was left over, that people took and said, okay, I'm just going to make sure I've got some from tomorrow, just in case God doesn't come through for me. And see, how many times do we think that? Oh, what if God doesn't come through for me? I need to make sure I've got a little bit more. I've got to make sure I do this. And I've got to make sure I do that. And has this been taken care of? And God says, I want to make sure you're taken care of. So just trust me. But we as human beings, we get our own selves in the way. And we, have our, we do our own works. And we're trying to live off of yesterday's manna. And the only thing it's good for the next day, unless it's the Sabbath day of rest is to get stinky and filled with worms. See, the Bible says that our righteousness, our works, the things we try to do without the Lord's help, it's like filthy rags. And God says, I want to give this to you six out of seven days of the week. Day six, grab double because you're going to need it because tomorrow there's not going to be any. And he didn't want God's people to go hungry because remember, they had been complaining. Oh, we don't have the food. Oh, don't, we don't have the bread. See, this is not to say 
that everything that humans touch turn out badly. Because we live in a world where there is, an, where there is a community of people that think, oh, whatever humans touch, it turns bad. It's awful because human beings are just so bad. Nature is bad because humans touch it. We need to leave well enough alone. Now, I will tell you this. I agree. There are some things that we need to do a better job being environmentally conscious because God told Adam to take dominion and subdue the earth, but it didn't mean to, you know, to, to just rip it all to pieces. It meant be a good steward with what God has entrusted into your care. Be a good steward with what God has blessed you with. And there's people that say, well, everything humans touch turns out badly. Without Jesus, it sure can. See, this passage, here's what it's talking about in in Exodus chapter 16. It's talking in terms of our obedience to what the Lord is instructing. See, that is a key point in this passage of Scripture. It's obedience. Obedience brings intimacy with God obedience brings intimacy with God. See, when we try to approach the Lord on our own terms, God says, no, it's just not going to work. It's not going to work that way. Obedience brings intimacy with God. See, like Pastor JJ showed us last week, in in a few chapters ahead, as we were reading in Exodus chapter 19 and 20 last week, the people, will t- the people told Moses, they said, you go talk to God for us. You let him talk to you, and then you come tell us what God says. And there is a point of intimacy that God wants to have with us. See, how many times have we heard from the Lord, and we still think that our way is a better way? I mean, what if God doesn't come through for us? Well, what if he does? What if we listen and obey, and God actually does what he says he's going to do. Now, I know that's a bit of a rhetorical question. It's a rhetorical statement. But the Bible says that God is not a man that he should lie. God will do what he says he will do. He always does. See, when we think that our way still might be a better way, that's not intimacy. It's not intimacy. It's a cop-out, and it's based in fear, it's based in insecurity, and it's based in a feeling of unworthiness. And God says, okay, I haven't give you a, given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. God says, I have given you my spirit. I have given you all of me. Everything you need, I have given you to be intimate with him. See, the manna that we harvest today, it's enjoyable, it's delightful, it's filling according to Exodus chapter 16, 12. And there was a minimal investment to collect it. All the people of Israel had to do was go collect it. That's all they had to do. They had to get up, get out of their tent, wait for the dew to kind of melt off, and then there was the manna, and all they had to do was go collect it, put it in their canisters, collect enough for them, collect enough for their family, and that was it. Simple. God gave them quail in the evening, To have meat because he knew they needed protein. God made us. He knows that we need protein and carbs and stuff to survive. Amazing that God made us and he knows what he's doing. So all the people had to do was go and collect the manna. So I'd like to ask you a question that I'd like you to, to write down and think about this next week. Here's the question. I'd like you to pray about this as well. What are you doing to be intimate with God? Maybe write the question this way as you're taking notes. What am I doing to be intimate with God? What am I doing to be intimate with God? I want you to think about that. Pray about that. Bring that before the Lord. I want you to be honest with yourself. Because this is something that I have been going through uh, since we've been in this series. What am I doing? What am I? What is Tim Versalono doing to be intimate with God? What are the steps that I'm taking to be more intimate with God. And I want you to come back to it. See, our investment, like the people of Israel, can be as minimal or as much as you make it today. You're here today. You tuned in today. You logged on to the service. You're worshiping. You made an investment to be here today. You may not be in our live service with us today that we started at 8.30 and then another at 10.30. That's fine. You made an investment. You're here today. You're worshiping today. You're partnering with us today. And it's not just that you're partnering with us, but you're here saying, God, I'm here to hear you speak to me 
so I can be intimate with you. You're making the investment. You're making the effort to say, God, I want to hear your voice right now. See, the people of Israel, they were instructed in Exodus 16 to go out every day and collect the manna, and on day number six, collect twice as much because day number seven, it ain't going to be there. You need to get enough for tomorrow, today, on the sixth day of the week. Because on day seventh, God says, I want you to rest. We've been talking in this series. That's not something that we as Americans know how to do very well, is it? We have a really hard time just stopping. I know I have a hard time stopping and just resting. Like we talked a few weeks ago, we need to slow down. We need to slow down. Because God intended us to slow down and not be always going 24-7, 365 days a year. Go, 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 go with no stop. See, what are you doing to be intimate with God? Are you spending time in the Word? Are you spending time in worship? Are you spending time in prayer? Oh, no, Pastor, I don't have time to do all that. I, I'll, just, I'll just let you go before the Lord for me. You just tell me what God's telling you. Well, that sounds a little bit suspicious. It sounds kind of like what the people did in Exodus 19, where they told Moses, you go hear from God, and you tell us what he's saying. God wants to talk to you. He doesn't just want to talk to you through me. He, God talks better to you individually than me talking to you because God wants you to know what his voice sounds like. I'm glad that you're listening and I'm praying that you're hearing what the Lord is telling you through my voice. But God wants to speak to you. God wants to speak through you. Do something with what God is speaking to you right now. Put it to use in your life. See, God has a now thing, right now thing, that he wants to do that can only be done with freshly gathered manna. Why do we talk about getting in the word? Why do we talk about spending time in prayer? Why do we talk about worshiping the Lord more than just Sunday? Because Sunday won't sustain me through Friday. There's way too many Christians that think one day a week is good for me. I punched my card. I went to church. I did my thing. Yay, God. Yay, me. I'm all set. And God says, no, I have a right now work that I want to work in you Sunday and on Monday and on Tuesday and on Wednesday and on Thursday. Remember at the beginning of this year, we talked about, okay, so what, are, what is our life going to look like if we spend one day a week in the word? If we spend two days a week in the word, three days, there's a little bit of a blip on the graph, remember? But on day number four, we spend four days in the word, everything increases in our life exponentially. We get to know God's voice more. Our marriages are healthier. Our lives are better. Boy, I think that was a right on prophetic word in the beginning of January because the Lord knew that COVID would be happening in March and that our world would be in a huge shakedown right now and that Christians would be getting sifted like never before. God wants to give you a right now word, but he can't do it with yesterday's stinky, wormy manna. He wants to do it in your life right now. I don't know about you, but the thought of eating stinky, wormy manna doesn't sound very appealing to me. I like my food to be fresh. I like my food to be tasty. I like to be sanitary. I like to make sure it goes in and does what it's accomplished, what's, what it's set in there to do. See, God has a right now work that he wants to do that can only be done with freshly gathered manna, not day old manna. So let me do this. You mentioned, we mentioned it again, we talked about manna, but I want to talk about autopilot. I want to share some thoughts about this phrase. You're probably thinking, okay, where are you going with this, you know, intimacy and manna and autopilot? Stick with me. Don't go anywhere yet because it's all going to come together. Here's some thoughts about autopilot. When, a, when an airplane is on autopilot, it's not exactly flying itself, but it is, it is set to maintain a course or altitude while the pilot concentrates on other details of operating the airplane. So autopilot doesn't control the airplane, which way you're going, kind of like how, how the new self-driving cars uh, are, are doing. Autopilot works very differently in an airplane. It's set to maintain a course or altitude 
while the pilot can concentrate on other details of operating the airplane. Now, this is interesting as well. Listen to this. The slang, here's, let me give the definition of autopilot. Then I want to give you a slang meaning of autopilot. Here's, here's the definition. It is a cognitive state in which you act without self-awareness. You've probably heard the phrase, you may have even used the phrase, I was so tired I was on autopilot at work all day today. I was so tired, I slept so bad last night, I just felt like I was on autopilot, where you're just kind of going through the motions, and you do your thing at work, and you get in the car, and how did I get home? There's been times I was so tired at work that I got home, I thought, I don't even remember driving home on the road, and I thank Jesus that he was with me. That's what it's talking about. The slang meaning, that, that, which brings us right to the slang meaning of autopilot, which means it's out of habit. You're doing what you're doing out of habit. You just go through the motions. You're doing the same thing day in, day out. You're just on autopilot. It's a cognitive state in which you act without self-awareness. Now, here's where we're bringing this home. The people of Israel were on autopilot for over 400 years. Here's what I mean by that. They find themselves a month and a half after the exodus from Egypt, and they're complaining already. Well, they'd actually begun complaining before this. But here they are, 45 days, roughly 45 days ago, they were in Egypt getting ready to leave, and 45 days, they're saying, oh, man, look at, look at, here, read with me again, Exodus 16, verses 1 to 3. The entire Israelite community departed from Elam and came to the wilderness of Sin. <coughs> Excuse me. The wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. So this happened, this event where manna happens, happens before Moses went to Mount Sinai and God wrote on the tablets and the Ten Commandments and so on and so forth. This happens before all that. It says, on the 15th day, day of the second month after they had left the land of Egypt in verse 1. 45 days later they're griping and complaining and it says in verse 2 the entire Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness the Israelites said to them oh if only we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when we sat by pots of meat and we ate all the bread we wanted Instead, you brought us into this wilderness to make this whole assembly die of hunger. Oh, we had so much meat in Egypt and all the bread we wanted to eat. Yeah, you know what they also had in Egypt? They were making bricks without straw. They were getting whipped and killed. See, the people of Israel still had a slavery mindset, and they were obviously, obviously still on autopilot, which is what? It's a cognitive state in which you act without self-awareness. They were responding out of habit. We get up in the morning, we go get whipped, we go make some bricks, we go get something to eat, maybe it's enough. We go home at the end of the day, we go to bed, and we say, Oy vey, I'm a slave in the land of Egypt. Is life going to ever get any better? Then they get up the next morning, they eat something, they they get whipped, they go make bricks, and they, you see, they had this slavery mentality, this slavery mindset, because that's all generations of Israel knew for years living in the land of Egypt. They were acting out of habit. They were responding out of habit, habit and they were in a cognitive state in which they acted without self-awareness. They got up, it's like that old Dunkin' Donuts commercial, remember from the 70s and 80s? The guy got up, oh, it's time to make the donuts. Time to make the donuts. And the Israelites, it was time to make the bricks. It's time to make the bricks. Whoosh, you're not working fast enough. Whoosh. And here they are complaining. They're saying, oh, in Egypt we had all, the, we sat by pots of meat and we had all the bread we wanted, but you brought us out in this stinking wilderness to die, Moses. Really? Really? They had so much in ab abundance in Egypt that they sat by pots of meat and they ate all the bread they wanted? I, I don't think so. See, when we have this mindset when we 
come out of the life that we used to live, God says, okay, there's some things that not only need to shift, but need to be broken in our lives as people. Because God did not create you to be under it. He created you to be over whatever is trying to hold you down. How does that happen? You get intimate with God. You begin to know his voice. You know what he sounds like. And when he begins to whisper in your ear and he says, son, daughter, I made you for more than this. I made you to be a king and a queen and a ruler over the things that try to bring you down. It goes against the very grain of what we were brought up in, of what we were born into, and every single one of us is born into sin. See, let me get really real for just a moment. Here's a window into my world. It's all too easy to go through life on autopilot. It, 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 it's easy. You get up and you do the thing and you do the ministry and you do this and you do that and you reach a message and you pray for people and you... It's all too easy to do life on autopilot. Here's, here's a list of several top concerns I was reading just today. So this is, uh, today is Friday. So this came out just this morning. It's a list of several top concerns of millennials from around the world. Uh, some of these I think about more than others. And even though I'm not a millennial, I'm a Gen Xer, I'm still pastor to baby boomers, I'm a pastor to Gen Xers, I'm a pastor to Gen Yers, which are also called millennials, and I'm a pastor to Gen Zers. So I'm pastor a whole lot of people, and God's called me to serve a whole lot of people. He's called me to serve you. And so I love doing what I'm doing, but there's things where it gets too easy to get on autopilot. Now, before you're thinking, oh, man, pastor, you get on autopilot. I know you get on autopilot, too. There's things that we all get on autopilot together, and we don't go and get fresh manna for the day. Come on. So here are some things. Here's, here's a list of some things that I found that just came out today. Issues, such as people issues, which include Marriage issues, isolation, we heard about that last Sunday with Pastor JJ's message, substance abuse, etc. Those are all people issues. We've seen more of this in the past five months with COVID. JJ and my counseling load has gone off the chart. Marriage counseling, off the chart. Individual counseling, off the chart. Because we're living in a world that is impacted. There's people issues, inequality, such as racial inequality. We've seen an epidemic proportion of that. Financial inequality, homelessness, and discrimination. We live in a beautiful part of the country. JJ and I had the opportunity to go out on the lake the other day and saw some incredible homes. But you go downtown or you go to some places here in the lakes region, and man, people who have homes that are worth millions and millions of dollars on the lake and you go to a part here in Laconia and you see people walking on the street. There is a huge disparity between who has what and who doesn't have what. There's people just trying to make it from day to day and people who have second and third homes in this area. There's war, there's politics, COVID, health concerns, climate change, which interestingly enough, climate change was the number one concern of millennials. Let me tell you what the number one concern of your pastor is. The salvation of your soul and the eternity that God says we are going to spend in one place or the other. That is my primary concern. Are there other things in in life that I'm concerned about? Yes. But my primary concern is where are you spending eternity? Do you know that Jesus loves you? And are you doing the things that God made you to do? Are you becoming all God made you to be? Or are you stuck in this non-intimate place of slavery like Israel was for years and you don't know how to break out of it? The Holy Spirit is saying, I want to shake you out of this to get you out from where you were into the place that I've called you to be. See, many Christians are flying, flying on autopilot and not course collect correcting along the way. We can't do ministry how we did it in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, in the 2000s, or the 210s. We can't do it like we did six months ago. We need fresh manna today. We as Christians have got to get off of autopilot and open up our eyes and open up our ears and say, God, what are you speaking today? What is the fresh manna you have for me today? Because remember, God wants to be intimate with you and I. He wants to be intimate with you and me. And we need to learn how to put him first in everything. And we need to learn how, we need to, learn how to listen to him and take action. 
Our days of Christians being on autopilot have got to be over. Our days of trying to live off of stinky, wormy manna, even though the manna the day before was great and awesome and it tasted good, but manna burgers, but manna bread, whatever manna you made, God says it's a brand new day. Isaiah 43, he says, don't remember the great things, even though they may have been great, because I want to do a new thing. He wants to do it in you and through you. He says, stop living off of yesterday's manna and get a now word from me that you put into action in your life. So I'm going to come back and ask the question again. What is God speaking to you today? What is God speaking to you today? What do you need to do to get off autopilot and get intimate with God? How are you going to take action with what he's telling you? Let me read those three things again. What is God speaking to you today? What do you need to do to get off autopilot and get intimate with God? And how will you take action with what he is telling you? Some of you have been going around the same mountain time after time after time, and God is saying, stop the insanity. Get fresh manna. Get a now revelation of what I want to do in you and through you. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me? Lord, I thank you. I thank you that you love us so very much. And I thank you, God, that you are telling us that you want to do a new thing. You want to give us fresh manna every day. But it is up to us to gather it in your strength and then put it to use. You may be listening to the sound of my voice today and maybe you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. If you haven't, would you pray this simple prayer with me? Would you say, Father God, I come to you in Jesus' name. I give you all my past all my successes and failures, all my sin, I give it to you now. I ask you to forgive me. Jesus, I receive your forgiveness. Would you make me brand new? Holy Spirit, fill me to overflowing. Baptize me with your power. And I will live the rest of my life for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Friend, if you just prayed that prayer for the first time, maybe the second time, The Bible says that everything in your life, all the old is gone. Everything from this moment on is brand new. You just became a Christian. Down at the bottom of the screen, you see the info right there. It says info at lfcnh.org. Would you drop us a note? Let us know. Pastor, I just prayed that prayer. You just became a Christian. We want to help you get started in your walk with the Lord. If you prayed for the Holy Spirit to baptize you with his power and fill you with the Spirit, you just... We're believing and praying that you just got filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit. Jesus wants to work in your life. Drop us a note. We want to help you get started in your walk with the Lord. Well, thank you for being with us today. As always, thank you so much. We are so grateful for your continued faithfulness and giving. We have a couple announcements. Today uh, at 1 o'clock p.m. this afternoon, we are going, we're going to be having a memorial service for our dear sister Gail Meinhold at the church building downtown. 22 Pleasant Street in downtown Laconia. We would love to see you uh, as we celebrate the life of Gail Meinhold. We have water baptism coming up Sunday, September 6th. Next Sunday is going to be a great Sunday. We're doing something really awesome called Simple Sunday. We're going to have simple worship. We're going to have a simple salvation message. I want to encourage you. Would you invite a friend maybe to either watch online or to bring to church with you? So next Sunday, it's going to be a great time together. And then next Sunday night at 6 o'clock p.m., we're doing something something brand new called a hymn celebration. We're going to be singing the great hymns of the church. I want to invite you, come and join us. It's going to be a great time as we worship the Lord together. And then we also have coming up, uh, we have Life Group, our Life Group Expo is going to be September 13th and 20th. Come check out life groups that are happening right now and that we'll be relaunching in the fall. One of those life groups is going to be a great one. It's going to be Financial Peace University. It is going to be a great time. If you want to get your finances on track, you want to make sure you sign up. You can get all the information at our website. or You can go to info at lfcnh.org. We can get you all the information that you need to sign up. Well, again, thank you for being here with us today. We love you. Would you stretch your hands this way now and receive this blessing? Lord, we thank you that you have called us to be intimate with you. And Lord, today, as we are not only hearers of your word, but doers of your word, I make this declaration 
Church, that you would be the head, not the tail, that you would be above and not beneath, blessed and not cursed. And may whatever you set your hands to, may it prosper as you live a life that is not on autopilot and you receive fresh manna from the Lord in Jesus' name. And if you receive that today, would you shout amen? Amen. God bless you. We love you. We look forward to seeing you at 1 o'clock today for Gale service, and we look forward to seeing you real soon. Have a great week, everybody. Bye now.